Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Breaking Drydex Mower Talk at the first conference 2021. My name is Gustavo. I'm a security researcher and manager at Immunity, which is part of AppGates. And we also have Felipe in the call. Hello, everyone. I'm Felipe Dominguez, security researcher at Immunity. In this presentation, we have two different goals. First, showing how malware analysis can be used to identify a threat capabilities, extract IOCs, and automate detection. And second, showing how a full knowledge on a threat can help us building tools to fight against it. For that, we'll analyze Tridex, one of the most popular malware families currently active, and then develop a vaccine that can be deployed on systems to protect against it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let me go over really quick over the presentation's agenda. We will start by a brief introduction about Drydex, showing its anatomy and how it usually works. Then we will demonstrate how the payload could be obtained when you have the packet file. And once we have the payload, we will then cover some of the main features about this malware, such as the encrypted strings, the CTU communication, and also what we did to automate the actionable data extraction with a Python script. Later, we will demonstrate how Drydex works when it comes to the Windows API resolution and how we exploited that to create the vaccine. All right, so first things first, uh, Drydex is one of the most relevant banking projects in the wild. It has first appeared about 10 years ago as Crydex, uh, sharing a lot of features with the game of Zeus, which was another major threat. Across the years, uh, Drydex ha has launched a few versions with many specific features, some of which we will show in this presentation. All right, so let's take a look in the infection chain. Uh, Drydex is usually delivered through an infected Microsoft Office file, which downloads or drops the Drydex loader. The loader is responsible for contacting the C2 server and to download additional files, such as the main bots and other modules. So the bot contains most of the Drydex functionalities, such as the keylogger and the web injections. And as just mentioned, Drydex is modular, which means that it can download and execute additional payloads, such as a VNC file, which allows remote access, and a SOX prox module. This research is mainly focused on the Drydex loader, and that's because we wanted to make sure that we can extract the C2 server addresses, which are stored in the loader. Also, we believe that the loader is the best layer to implement the vaccine, as the downloader can vary a lot. And many of the features implemented by the loader is also present in the other layers. So we can use most of our research in the bots and the modules as well. So the first thing we need to do when we have a Drydex loader is to unpack the file. Almost every loader we have analyzed contained a custom packer and the payload is never written into disk, which means that we have to unpack the file and dump it so we can analyze. Uh, the process is pretty straightforward. Once the file is running, it decrypts and executes a small DLL in memory, which is responsible for unpacking the payload. So here we can see the same process in the immunity debugger. So first, the encrypted DLL is copied to a recently allocated memory. Then after decrypting the bytes, the DLL is executed and the payload is unpacked to another memory location, which is eventually executed. The Drydex loader could be easily unpacked by monitoring the calls to virtual lock and virtual protect, or by using a tool such as a Hollows Hunter. Once we have the unpacked loader, we can start the analysis on the real file. One of the most important things is that all the Drydex strings are encrypted in the binary, probably to evade detection and make the analysis more difficult. Fortunately, it's not a complicated process. Uh, all the strings are located in the R data section of the PE file, and you could identify them by checking the IDA cross reference to the location or using another disassembler of your preference. So here we have an example showing the reference to these R data offsets, and we can see that it is some nonsense bytes, not showing any clear text. The structure is pretty simple. The algorithm used by Drydex is RC4, and the first 40 bytes is the key, meaning that the rest of the blob is just encrypted data. By using a small Python script, as demonstrated in the second image, we could easily decrypt those bytes and review the real stream. So another very important part is the CTU communication. 
As mentioned before, the Dried Exploder is the one responsible for contacting the C2 servers to download the bots and the additional files. The first thing is how the C2 commands are stored in the file. So Drydex uses a very simple process. It calculates the CRC32 hash of the string that represents the commands. So in this example, the string bot, which is the command to download the Drydex main file, is represented with this hexadecimal number, which is the CRC32 hash of the string. And the malware does that for all the other strings slash commands. So the way the C2 server address is stored in the binary depends on the Drydex version. In the latest, which is the one that we are showing in this presentation, all the addresses are stored as bytes in the PE data section. As demonstrated in the first image, uh, we have first two bytes that represents the botnet ID, then one byte that contains the amount of IP addresses that this loader can connect. And finally, we have the IP addresses that are four in this case. Here on the right, we can see in immunity debugger the exact function that loads the data on the left by parsing those bytes and building the IP string. So after parsing the addresses, the loader sends an initial request to the C2 server with a few information about the infected machine. So in the left, we can see that the data is probably encrypted since we can't understand what was submitted. So after reversing a couple of samples, we saw that this information is encrypted with RC4 and the key is among Tridex encrypted strings, which we already demonstrated how to extract. So by decrypting the data, we can see some of the information that is being uploaded to the server, such as the computer name, the botnet ID, the common strings, as well as the list of the installed software in the machine. All right, so once you know how all of this works, uh, what we can do to make our life easier when it comes to the analysis? So at this point, using Python or another language of a preference, we can automate the extraction of the botnet ID and the C2 server list, which could be very useful for socks or any blacklist you may need to feed. We can also decrypt the strings, which contains many useful data, such as the key to decrypt the C2 server communication that we can also automate. One point that we need to make clear is that the automation will not work in 100% of the cases, since you can have different versions or variants of the malware. But according to our experience, a lot of code is shared across modern versions. So you could easily track the changes and update your scripts to keep them working normally. Thinking about that, we have compiled everything we could in what we call it the Drydex Analysis Toolkit. It was everything done with Python and the script can do pretty much what we just described it without the need of analyzing the file manually or executing it. In the GitHub page, you can find all the options provided by the script as demonstrated in this second image. So here's an example. Uh, we have unpacked a Drydex loader and then executed the script with the verbos and the dash C option, which extracts the C2 server list. First, the script outputs the binary information, such as the hashes and the compiled dates that we read from the PE header. And then, in case the file was dumped from memory and the PE file was not unmapped to disk, the script can do this automatically for you to save you some time. Then it will try to locate the C2 server list inside the binary. And in case it founds, it will parse the data and displays all the addresses in the screen for you. Also, if you use a dash A or the dash S option, the tool will decrypt all the strings it can find also printing on the screen the possible RC4 keys used to encrypt and decrypt the network communication. And finally, all the results are written into disk so you can have a full report. All right, so what next? I will now give the floor to Felipe, which will show the main discovery we did about Drydex. After understanding Drydex, we would like to cover one more Drydex feature, dynamic API call resolution. But first, to understand it, let's consider the default way programs make API calls. Let's say in the program you are developing, you want to generate a message box. In this case, you would import the Windows library and call the message box function. In the compiled program, this translates to an entry on the PE import directory table, referencing the dynamic library and a lookup table containing all the functions available. When the execution starts, the operation system will allocate the library in the memory if it's not already there. 
and will provide the address so the binary can execute the API calls. In a similar way, one can build DLLs with functions it would like to contribute as a library or keep outside the main executable. In that case, the binary will contain an export table addressing the function names and its addresses inside the binary. Let's get a little more deep into that. I promise this will be important. In the Windows NT operational system family, we have what is called a process environment block. This is a structure heavily used by the SO. We can find references into the pad in the Windows internals documentation, but a lot of the fields are not documented at all, as they should only be manipulated by this operational system during the binary load and execution. Every process has its own process environment block, and in one of its fields, we have a pointer to the LDR data structure, which holds a list used to store all the DLLs loaded in the process. It contains, among other things, the DLL name and the base address pointing to where it's stored in the memory. So when you call an API call in your program, that's what happens. As one can imagine, analyzing a binary import table can provide a lot of information on its usage and can even be used to identify potential malicious behavior. That's why, as an NT analysis technique, some malware employs strategies to hide their imports. Some uses Windows functions like load library to load the DLL inside the code. But for those that use this feature alone, we can find the loaded DLLs and the executed function just by extracting the malware strings. In the left here, we can see the imports table of a malware that loads the HV API 32 DLL. This contains functions regarding registry manipulation. So as an analyst, I know I need to monitor the registries to see if the malware is loading or reading or storing anything there. On the right, we have a couple of samples from the Drydex loader, the top one being the unpacket sample and the bottom one being the packet sample. We can see that it doesn't reveal anything relevant on the malware capabilities. If Drydex API calls are not available in the binary and extracting the malware strings, we can't find any references to them either. How does it call them? Reverse engineering the binary, we found that the malware executes Windows API calls just like that. Instead of calling a function imported from a library, it calls this function that we named malware API resolver. This function receives a couple arguments, both CRC32 hashes. Now, the malware access the process environment block table and run these functions on each DLL name, generating a CRC32. If the CRC32 matches the one pass it as an argument, it repeats the same with the library functions, and voila, it resolved the API call. It just returns the function address to the program so the execution can continue. Now, what happens when a DLL is not found in the process environment block? In other words, what happens when the operational system haven't loaded that DLL in the process yet? Well, the malware loads it itself. It will search the system directory and make the same process with the DLL names until it finds one that matches the CRC32 and it will load it into the memory using the NTDLL LDR load DLL method. For analysts interested in analyzing Drydex, in our GitHub, we also uploaded a NIDA script. You just need to add the malware API resolver offset, and it will comment in the decompiler every call with the real DLL and function the malware is trying to execute. Summarizing, that's how Drydex hides its API calls. It will first check on a table that it builds in memory for the API hash passed as an argument. If not found, it will check the process environment block for the loaded DLL to populate the same table. If it's still not found, it will search the system directory for the DLL by the file name, should then load it on the same table and populate it. Now, let's go to the interesting part. We left this functionality to present last, as this is the one that we will exploit to create a vaccine for Dreadix. As some of you may have noticed, it, the malware does not have a way to validate exactly what DLL is loaded on its memory. The only verification it has is the calculated hash. From the previous diagram, we can see how the malware behaves loading a DLL from the disk. Simplifying, it will call the malware API resolve, search the DLL in the syswall64 directory, in our case, loads the DLL that matches the condition, and executes the exported function.
CRC32 is a very small hash using only 32 bits. It's very prone to hash collisions. So what we're going to do is to create another DLL with a different name, but the same hash. So when the malware tries to load the system DLL, it will load ours instead. And when it tries to execute any function on it, our vaccine code will be triggered. We can use that to sabotage Dridex, stopping the process or generating an alert. Adding a breakpoint to the function that loads DLL from the disk, we can see that the first one loaded in this sample is the shell 32 DLL. Now that we have a candidate for our collision, we can just brute force a bunch of strings to generate compatible names. Let's just not forget it will be a DLL, so it needs to end on dot .dll, and that the brute forced name is compared in uppercase. We won't show how to build a brute force script for this, as you can just iterate through hexadecimal characters and test one by one. It's that easy to create a CRC32 collision. Now, with the name of our candidates, we will build a simple DLL to generate an alert, pausing the thread, and then it will exit the process, effectively stopping the malware. Our DLL needs to have the same export as shelter 2 DLL. So let's add the same API names to the exports.dev file. Now, with the compiled DLL, we just need to add it on the same directory Dreadix will look for the DLLs. In our case, the syswolf64 directory. As we can see, in the same step as before, when we detected shelter 2dll being loaded, now the malware is loading our custom-made DLL. Let's execute Dreadix on a vaccinated environment to see what happens. So here we have our custom-made DLL and the Dridex loader. We will open the syswol64 directory, drop the DLL there, and execute the malware to see how it behaves. So right after its execution, it will show our alert, and after clicking OK, the process will exit, effectively stopping the Dridex infection. And voila, we are protected against Dridex, at least from this sample. We showed here a very simple vaccine implant that only exits the process. But one might modify our hook stub to add more functionality. You can create a memory dump of the process before stopping it, or even signaling the company endpoint, uh, alerting that the system might be compromised. Now, let's keep in mind that this is not a silver bullet against Redex. New versions can employ different DLLs, or shelter to DLL might be already in memory but this process can be replicated for any DLL Dredix loads. So if the technique remains the same, you just need to map new candidates and build your own vaccine. It seems a bit odd to build a vaccine for one strain of malware, but let's consider a scenario where one of your clients was infected and you found the Dredix sample in one of the machines. You could then deploy the vaccine as part of your incident response, helping in the containment phase stopping the infection from spreading to others. And in the remediation phase, avoiding reinfection of the machine you just found. You can also use that to detect other machines infected with the malware, as the next time the malware will load, it will load the vaccine instead. Building the vaccines is not a replacement for any security solution, but it can be very useful on investigating or protecting against a specific threat. All right, thank you very much, Felipe. Uh, here are some of the references and the resources that we use it across our research in case anyone needs further details. And that was pretty much it. Thank you very much for attending the talk. And this is the end, at least until Drydex updates your new version, right? So thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone.